Well, let's get started. So I'm on the line with my old friend, Henny Sender, who is in Hong Kong, and we have the fireplace going because this okay. is a fireside chat. Um, and um, I, I should start by introducing uh, our long friendship. Um, I met Henny many, many years ago when I, both of us were living in Tokyo, uh, and I was practicing law there, and Henny was a reporter, um, and we've kept up uh, with each other ever since then through various iterations of our respective careers, um, including Henny being uh, at the Wall Street Journal um, and then at the uh, Financial Times and then most recently at BlackRock where she is now in Hong Kong. Um, and she is a peripatetic reporter, one of the most uh, well-known financial reporters, uh, always on the, on the road, always um, um, moving and um, frequently in India, uh, as well as uh, Asia and Japan and China and Japan, of course, New York, London, everywhere. Uh, so you can imagine what this, uh, what COVID has done to her routine. Um, uh, but um, I don't know, Henny, do you want to introduce yourself some more than beyond what I've just said? Because I know that I've just touched the surface. Um, just very briefly. Um... I, I used to write a lot about private equity, but private equity is backward looking. It takes you to yesterday's companies. So well after Howard came to this insight, I realized that venture capital was going to be huge in China and venture capital takes you to tomorrow's companies. And um, all of us who live on this side of the Pacific think we see the future more clearly because we think it's um, emerging out of Asia. However, Howard had that insight many years ago when he lived in Shanghai. Well, um, I, I wish that I could be traveling um, to Hong Kong to visit you and others um, in this uh, pandemic, but uh, it's, I guess we're gonna have to wait. Uh, Henley, Henny. So, uh, but meanwhile, we have Zoom uh, and uh, we have this conference and we have this panel or this fireside chat. And this fireside chat is, is about um, fair, a fairly sort of out there subject, which is can fintechs disrupt the dollar? And so we're going to have to work up to this subject because it's a, there's a, several steps to this. Uh, but so I, first I, <clears throat> I want to ask Henny, if you could sort of talk to us about what the rest of the world is thinking about the dollar, because we are all sitting, most of us are sitting in the US and we of course know that the dollar is under pressure in many different ways and that the rest of the world may not love the dollar, but can you, can you give us your perspective on how uh, uh, different countries, different markets, different players around the world think about the dollar? Well, there's the United States and there's everyone else when it comes to the dollar. And um, CFIUS has a lot to do with that. And um, it was really brought home to me a few years ago. Um, every year in Shanghai in June, there's an event called the Lujatwe Forum and it's a financial forum. And one year, Everyone on my panel agreed that the world, a world in which the US dollar is the only reserve currency is not a very ideal world. And the US uses its monopoly, its quite own virtual monopoly, you know, on the payment system to implement its will in areas that are totally inappropriate. And um, on my panel was Bill Winter from Standard Chartered Bank. I was supposed to have um, one of the top executives is HSBC as well. And um, I have take part in a lot of panels and one of those other panels, I had the French um, prime minister, Francois Villon on my panel. What everyone agrees, Chinese, Japanese, French, German, 
UK is that the US takes advantage of its position of having a reserve currency as what Barry Eichengren calls, uh, professor at Berkeley calls, you know, unwarranted privilege. And Standard Chartered Bank and HSBC and many other banks have been subject to huge fines by the US for alleged transgressions, know your customer, anti-money laundering, all this kind of thing. And the fines they got were huge, $10 billion north of that, compared to the kind of fines US institutions do for things that are often equally egregious or more so. And Stan Chart actually wanted to plead guilty, uh, non-guilty, and their lawyers, Ed Sullivan and Cromwell said, we can't let you plead guilt, uh, not guilty because you will so enrage the US that they will shut you out of the US payment system. And if you're out of the US payment system, you're out of business. And one of the cores of the US payment system is an institution in Belgium, which operates a lot of the infrastructure called SWIFT. Its members are banks, but the US was saying to the French banks, you trade with Iran, we're shutting you out of SWIFT. And that's what gave rise to a sense that the current system is not an ideal system. So that's the backdrop, too long of an answer. Okay. So, uh, you know, there, there are quite a few different elements to this, obviously. There's the reserve currency element. There's also the transaction currency element, the, the currency of uh, international payments. Um, and as I understand it, one of the key issues is that, you know, today the reality is that um, even if you have payments between third countries, you know, between Mexico and Italy, for example, that most of those payments are indirectly routed through New York because it's just more convenient for there to be transactions that involve the dollar in between those two currencies um, before they, uh, in order to get the transaction done more effectively. Um, and so the, the, the US um, government and this financial system has a lock or a, th or a throat hold or whatever you want to call it uh, on all these international uh, transactions. Uh, and then add that to the fact that the US um, government has a policy of sanctions, which you know, it pursues with a vengeance on certain, um, uh, certain types of, 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 of parties. And so then pretty much the whole world has to, or at least much of the world has to do the bidding of the US um, government. So um, it's in that context, I assume that, you're, that many of these uh, actors, whether it's governments or companies are are, um, are not happy. But can, can you um, talk a little bit about what measures, if any, the, the, the third country, countries around the world are taking to try to get around the dollar? Well, you know, I mean, so when I was chatting with Francois Villon, the French prime minister about this some years ago, he was saying, we have to make the Euro become more widely used. We have to supplement the US dollar. You know, Japan never aspired to see the yen as um, an international currency. They always wanted to control it. Um, China experimented, you know, up until 2015 with slowly relaxing capital controls of the renminbi. But so far, the dollar has a preeminent position in the world's currency system, the international monetary system. Most governments hold reserves. The majority of their reserves are US dollars. And one can argue, especially going forward, whether US treasuries are going to be considered the benchmark for a risk-free asset, which is why central banks want to hold them. Most trade in the world is denominated in dollars. Most direct foreign investment is in the form of dollars. 
So governments and companies are focused on how do we create alternatives to the dollar that will serve as a reserve currency for central banks to hold that will be convenient to denominate trade in and will be the currency of investment. At the same time, companies, particularly young fintech companies, to our point, Howard, are saying, can we create alternatives, digital alternatives to the existing international financial system? And um, you know, I think those alternatives are really, really interesting. And central banks are slowly experimenting with um, digital currencies, central bank digital currencies. So you have this kind of two pronged attack, both on the US dollar as the reserve currency of the world and on the pipes of the international monetary and payment system. And um, Howard and I were talking recently as we were getting ready for this chat about a very interesting company that is formally based in Hong Kong um, that has also has offices in Melbourne and Shanghai. Um, and it's called Air Wallet. And I was introduced to it both by my friends at Sequoia and at um, the Alibaba Entrepreneurs Fund in Hong Kong. And they have created a really, a really interesting alternative for international payments in a digital world that completely bypasses SWIFT. So it's independent of the US and its sanctions. And you know, to me, it's a beacon of the future. Can, and can you, heard, can you sorry, explain a little bit how AirWallet's system works so that it's able to accomplish this? So um, it's rather complicated, but if I am a SME say, in Kuala Lumpur, and um, I advertise on Tmall or Taobao, and um, somebody sitting in France orders from me, Air Wallex can arrange the payment, completely bypassing the system. And how that works technically, I advise you all to go on the Air Wallet's, um, um website, which, which explains how it works. But it, to it, it lives in a digital world and it totally bypasses the existing pipes of the system. Are they using I dollars in some fashion? I mean, are they keeping dollars in one, both countries or debits and dollars in different countries? They, they don't need to, but what they do is, so, you know, usually, you know, if I'm sitting in KL, it will go, you know, um, the, you know, they'll use the local currency to dollars and then dollars to renminbi in a conventional world. This one uses the mid market going through the foreign exchange market but doesn't rely on SWIFT at all. It, it is a totally a digital and direct world. Well, so-, so I can also mention um, your crypto event, Howard, and what um, David Chow was talking about with um, digital currencies and the Winter Olympics in Beijing. Maybe you want to talk a bit about that one. Because well, yes, I, I'd, I'd love to get to that too. Um, is there any other effort on the private front, though, before we get to uh, central bank digital currencies that you think is a disruptive force for the dollar? Well, I, I think that all of these things, you know, a digital world pose, 
you know, very interesting challenge. Right. Well, I mean, the the obvious one, of course, on the private side would be stable coins, right? I mean, you, the central bank digital currencies are not a private effort. They're a, you know, they're a government led effort, right? So yeah, before so we get to the government. With the two prongs. Right. So before we get to that side of the fence, maybe we should just let's finish up on the private side. So if if beyond air wallets, I mean, what do you think about the possibility of say stable coins or other digital currencies that are privately initiated becoming disruptive to the dollar? You know, I, I think there is such ill will against the dollar, plus the fact that most developed markets are doing everything they can to suppress the value of their currency. So I think there is so much incentive in the world today right. to say we are so unhappy with the existing system. And, right. you know, this is a far more efficient um, alternative to gold. Right, right. Well, you know, I, we're getting some questions and maybe I should just let the questioner insert himself um, into this discussion. Mark, if you're willing, Mark Louis, um, can we promote Mark? into the conversation as a speaker so I don't have to just repeat his questions. Mark, you can either ask your questions um, by audio or turn on your camera if you'd like, either way, uh, but maybe we can promote Mark. Hey, Mark. Howard, it's not clear to me that you ever should want to promote me into anything, but that's a good thing. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, Mark nice is a, a former uh, Goldman guy and, uh, and has been now a a venture and private equity investor for many years. Um, but good to see you, Mark. Why don't you ask your question directly so I don't have to read your question. Sure, Questions. and I apologize for typing it. Um, so honey, I've been listening to this. I, I probably have what I would characterize as more than just a passing familiarity with the area um, from my time um, at Goldman, but also from my time. Uh, what Howard didn't say is in addition to working in venture in the US, I've worked in venture in China for the last 15 years. Um, I've met with the guys at the PBOC. Um, I've met with a bunch of people in China, you know, at the ministerial level and on down. And I, I don't disagree with your assessment of what people's perspective is, um, you know, that they would like to have an alternative to the dollar. The problem that everybody comes up with is, for anything in size, and I mean, air wallet's probably fine if you want to talk about a few million dollars, but if you want to talk about a trillion dollars, there's really no place other, to put it other than in the US dollar and into the treasury market. I mean, you right. can't buy that much Japanese right. government bonds. You can't buy that much Euro denominated bonds. You can't buy that much SDRs or anything else. And so- well, but let me, let me, let me stop you on that. Mark, because I, I agree with you on all that. I mean, you know, the traditional argument against any competitor to the dollar is that it it's all peanuts, right? I mean, everything that everybody's doing is either, you know, incremental and very small at that, or, you know, it, it, it's, you know, if it's the room and B, it's not, it's capital controlled. So nobody's going to really actually put a lot of it, trust in it as a, as a, um, you know, as an international reserve currency. However, you know, we have reached the point now where uh, someone made the point this morning that the market cap of Bitcoin is over a trillion dollars, right? Um, and the market cap of all uh, digital currencies now is close to $2 trillion. So that's, we're talking real money here now. And so now, yes, I'm, I realize that digital currencies are not necessarily right now an alternative reserve currency to the dollar, although there are a lot of stable coins out there now. Right, and the stablecoin market cap is getting up there too. I mean, Ethereum and and Bitcoin are well over a trillion. Stablecoins are several hundred uh, billion. But how would you uh, respond to that? Um, you know, it's the same comment. I mean, if you want to drop a trillion dollars into any of those markets, you're going to blow them up. But I mean, I think the question I have for you, Henny, is um, I think all your conclusions are correct. The, the real question is, and, and certainly the PBOC would like to see a different regime. Um, what's going to be the catalyst to cause a change? It's, um, 
a, a great question. I think it makes more sense for me to turn it over to you. But before I do that, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I was talking to the CFO of the AIIB. And, you know, when they set that thing up, there was a debate about what currency do we lend in? And they actually looked at SDRs and they came to the exact conclusion that you've come to. It's just impractical. You know, I don't know if there will be one specific catalyst. I think that over time, you'll see liquidity come into the market. You know, there was a sense that Zhou Xiaochuan had gone too far in experimenting when he was governor of the PBOC, that he had created what became uncontrollable monsters in letting and slash Alibaba and Tencent have the overwhelming majority of digital payments that it posed systemic risk and it challenged the traditional financial system. But over time, I think they will be far more comfortable in seeing the renminbi more widely used. I mean, you know, in China, look at the volume of trading in Shanghai in oil. Why? Because it's rending the denominator. The Chinese say, why should oil be traded in dollars when Asia is by far the biggest market for oil? So over time, I think they will be more comfortable with relaxing capital controls. And they will, to go back to the earlier point and to throw the ball back to Howard, you know, there will be, you know, a central bank digital currency. And the Chinese are by far in the forefront. I was reading a very interesting report from JP Morgan, um, which came out in February, saying the Fed, because they are the beneficiaries of the status quo, is not really serious about moving forward with digital because they will be the biggest victim, which Jay Powell would definitely disagree with. But I do think as you see more and more, you know, people having incentives to trade these things, there will be more and more take up. These things will get more and more liquid over time. And then you'll see the, um, push from governments as well as private sector forcing these changes. I, I just think there's so much incentive at this time, but I'd love to get both of your views. Have we just lost uh, Mark? It looks like we have. Um, it's too bad. Um, well, anyway, so yes, I, you know, it, it, we had a discussion actually on this subject this morning on another panel around how the Fed is going to, the U.S. federal government is going to be moving more slowly than just about every other country for various reasons, including the one that you just mentioned, Henny. Um, and at the same time, China seems to be moving faster than most, if not all other countries in rolling out their CDBD, um, uh, uh, central bank digital currency. But um, there, there are limitations on that too. I mean, lots of people are worried about the Chinese version of the uh, central bank digital currency, partly because um, they're concerned that it will effectively become a surveillance currency, right? I mean, yeah. it will be, yeah. it's going to be controllable and um, um, usable in, as a tool in many ways by the government. Um, transparency into... Right the spending patterns of every household in right. China. And, and or even, you know, shutting it off if necessary, if they don't like what you're doing or if they, you know, so if they, don't, you like you, they yeah. don't like you. So there, there's that. And it's not just people worried about necessarily China doing that, but other countries might do the same thing as well. So there's, there is a concern about the, you know, central bank digital currencies as opposed to decentralized 
digital currencies. And so some people will argue that, you know, the ultimate um, competitor is going to be a decentralized currency, right? It's going to be somebody out there, maybe not Bitcoin or maybe Bitcoin. I, I have friends who argue that Bitcoin is the ultimate disruptor. Um, and, you know, you can, you can make the argument, you know, when, when Bitcoin was a hundred billion market cap, that's just, you know, it's not really a factor when it's a trillion, you know, then we're talking real money when it's 5 trillion, you know, who knows, maybe it will get there. Then, then, you know, there could be serious economic consequences. Um, so, well, I mean, if you had said a trillion, uh, a couple of years ago, people would have laughed you off the street. Right. Um, but here we are. So uh, who knows? Um, but then also you have all these stable coins that are uh, candidates out there. Um, and some of them are growing very fast. Um, and uh, we, you know, you, there are many use cases for stable coins that are happening. We heard from one, um, uh, one of the startups this morning that's actually using, uh, seeing stable coin use as an on-ramp for, uh, as a tool for retail purchases. They're, they're basically a platform that helps people use digital currencies to, to, um, to buy stuff online. Uh, they're saying they, they saw an increase from say five or 10% of stablecoin usage compared with uh, Bitcoin or, or Ethereum to now 30 or 40%. So st stable coins are actually starting to be used for real transactions, at least in their world. And they're, you know, they're growing very quickly as a company. So anyway, I, th those are some thoughts. And, you know, you do see an ecosystem evolving, you right. know, so, you know, a, a lot of um, regulators are saying to exchanges, you need to get insurance, you know, so, um, you know, there are now very interesting insurance startups in, on this side of the ocean that offer insurance against hacking. You know, so this, if I, you know, where is my, you know, court of appeal? How do I protect myself against losses? So all of these things are slowly emerging now. I think it's, it's so exciting to watch. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think the countries and central banks are going to be the last to ever adopt Bitcoin as a reserve currency is my guess. But, but, but the fact is that companies, corporations, and people are adopting Bitcoin as a store of value, right? I mean, that, that clearly has been happening. So, and, and that's happening at a scale that's not to be ignored. So anyway, um, any, any other thoughts, Mark? No, I apologize. I'm not sure exactly what I did, but somehow I got cut off and then I got put back in. No, I don't, look, I agree with all your assessments. It just, um, I've heard the same arguments made over the years about SDRs, um, about the, the, you know, the marketable RMB when uh, the PBOC put that first out, uh, first put that out. I heard that about the yen at different points in time and kind of none of it has really happened, at least in any size. Um, and I mean, I know people will say, well, you know, there's whatever, $500 billion worth of trade in this, that, or the other. But I mean, the truth is that, I mean, that's a nice number, but it's, it, it is still a, a drop in the ocean. And so I was just curious what people's thoughts were in terms of what might catalyze it, because it's been a, an issue that's been floating around for a while. And the demise of the dollar is either the transaction currency or the reserve currency has been predicted, you know, more times than I can count at this point. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with that. But, you know, the, uh, I think that ironically, the U.S. is doing everything it can to undermine the U.S. dollar. Yep. And, and, and despite, despite their best efforts, it doesn't appear to be working. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, they, they will succeed, I believe. I yeah. mean, I, you know, am very nervous holding dollars and U.S. treasuries. And I do think they are undermining it as a store of value. And it's a very happy conjunction of things. Yeah. Hey, listen, so we have to uh, uh, transition to our panel, Henny, which you will be moderating next. Uh, so um, Mark, thank you very much for, for joining us. We need to catch up. Um, oh, absolutely. 
Sorry, I couldn't be helpful. <laughs> no, no, you were. You were. Thank you for your perspective. 